You might know her best as Mira Calix. But we're about to find out a lot of things that you might not know and about a pretty interesting path to be uh, uh, how she ended up back here in South Africa right here today. So uh, uh, let, let's start it out way back. It's, uh, you're born in Durban? Yeah, I was um, born in Durban and um, I haven't been back here for a long time. And um, I landed up living in London, living in England, like probably quite a lot of people. Was that like straight out of like high school or something? Or? No, I studied. I studied photography and then okay. I moved um, to London really because I wanted a lot of things and, um, that I couldn't get here at the time because um, I grew up under sanctions. So mm -hmm. um, I really wanted to be able to go to gigs and I grew up sort of buying old copies of The Melody Maker and they used to get shipped in and we got them six weeks late. So everything you read about had already happened. And I really wanted that experience of being able to go to things and do things and buy records. Records were very expensive then, and I believe they're still very expensive now. So when you ended up in London, what did you, uh, uh, where did you start working, or like what did you do to like make a living? You know, you're there in London, you got to do something. Yeah, I had to do something. I, I did a lot of crappy jobs. I waitressed and did loads of things, and um, I landed up very luckily. Um, by accident, working in a really great record shop called Ambient Soho. And at the time, I was doing bookings for a club, um, which was based at Heaven, which is quite a well-known club in London, and it was called Megatripolis. And I was doing bookings for the Ambient um, Room. And um, I walked into this record shop that had just opened called Ambient Soho, and obviously I saw the sign, so I went in. And the guy who owned it was going away the next week and um, he asked if I could work. And um, so he just left me the keys and I started working there. <laughs> and that was really great. And basically, yeah, worked in a record shop, got lots of really cheap records because it was all at cost and just got to listen to records all day. And that's really the first time I heard a lot of Detroit stuff. Mm -hmm. So I'd, I'd really come into electronic music through indie music. So through bands like My Bloody Valentine and um, Stereo Lab and Spaceman 3, bands who were using drum machines and who were using sort of keyboards and, and synthesizers, but not really mainstream electronic stuff. And it doesn't stick to a verse chorus pattern. Um, so even though they're using guitars, which I really still love, um, the actual structure of tracks is, is quite free. So it was very similar at that time, it was like 91, 92, and it was very similar to stuff that was coming out on Warp. And, even though it sonically sounded different. Um, it had the same feel in the sense that the structures were very open. Mm -hmm. That was a pretty exciting time. There was so much going on. It was almost yeah. like an electronic music revolution that was happening like internationally. Yeah, and I think especially, um, I mean, internationally, internationally definitely, but especially in England, because <coughs> at that time you, <coughs> I'm sorry, I'm really dry. Um, you had, um, you know, the first Autechre album came out, you had, you know, the Aphex um, ambient works, and y you had a lot of that stuff. There were a lot of gigs and a lot of people doing, you know, their first gigs in London and uh, loads of parties and uh, really good things. So from throwing these parties, did you end up playing at them? I mean, you're working at the record store. Yeah. You must have, like, all the hot records, you know? Yeah. Um, I landed up playing kind of by accident because... Um, I was working in this club and they were, um, they were doing a night and they asked if I could play and I just went, yes. But I didn't really have a clue. I'd never even really looked at a mixer. So I just got all my shit together and took it down there and just played it. And um, not very well, which I still have that problem. But um, I got another gig and then I got another gig. and I, So I kept playing and people kept booking me. Um, so I must have been doing something right, but it wasn't the mixing part of it. And that was it, really. It just kept going. And um, it's been a, 10 years of, of just sort of wandering around going, oh, they booked me, you know, fantastic. So um, back then, when you were booked, what DJ name would <coughs> you use? Oh, I was just, just using my name, because my name's Chantal. And then uh, um, 
So the, the name Miracalix, does that come with productions? <clears throat> yeah, it came, I did my first record in 96 for Warp and it was just a two tracker, 10 inch. And at the time, um, I was actually working at the company and I didn't really want to put a record out under my name and um, I was a bit bashful and so this name kind of appeared. Um, but it's one of those things that just made sense. I really can't explain it in any other way. And um, I wrote it down and it, it looked good and it, I really liked phonetics. It sounded really nice and it sounded like a nice person. So I yeah. used it. I always thought you were like some weird Scandinavian lady. Yeah, there's actually, there is um, a, a, a town in, um, in Sweden called Kalix. But I didn't know that at the time. But uh, so, so you start DJing, you know, this is like going okay. And how, how did you go then to like working at Warp? Um, because I was doing, I did a lot of jobs basically. I did a lot of jobs all at once. And I worked for a record company called 4AD, mm -hmm. which is probably best known for the Pixies. Which I don't know if anyone here knows the Pixies. I, I'd, I'd say they're best known for their album covers. And for their <laughs> album covers. And but, uh, um, Cocteau Twins. Dead Can Dance. And Cocteau Tunes and Dead Can Dance and This Mortal Coil, all bands I really love. So I was working there and um, I was running a fanzine with some friends and we were reviewing a lot of Warp stuff. We got sent it. And um, one day I phoned up to speak to the um, girl there who did the press stuff and she'd left. So I applied for the job and did loads of interviews and got it. So, uh, uh, like, what year was that? What year did you start working there? Um, I started working there in 93. So that's pretty early on. Yeah. Still, then it's like, what, what was, like, when you first came there, what was, like, the first release you were responsible for? Um, I did Amber. I actually oh, did really? that. I did that f freelance before I <laughs> got a job there. <laughs> Not that Amber. No. <laughs> How long did you do the press stuff? That must, that, um, I could imagine that get really aggravating. Yeah, it does get <laughs> aggravating. Um, and uh, I did it for uh, about three years. But it was, you know, it's a good job, because it, mainly because it was a lot of music that I really loved. Um, and that was my motivation for doing it. I've w I really wanted other people to hear this stuff. And um, press is a, it's not a really great job, but you get to actually try and communicate. And it's just, it's a step along from working in a record shop. In a record shop, People come in and you say, you know, you should really buy this, it's great. And when you do PR, that, that's all you're doing. You're just trying to get it out there. You do this first record and you end up, uh, uh, did you do any, when did it go from recording to performing? Did you ever perform? I actually started playing live this year. So okay. I'm a real slow person. Um, and before that, I've just been, I've just been DJing. But... Um, it went really from that first record, which I, at the time, honestly just thought that's, I've put a record out and that's it. You know, I've got it and, you know, this little piece of vinyl and I can show it to my grandchildren and fantastic. And I really didn't think that it would go much further than that, simply because I was just making tracks for myself. And, um, but after a while I, I carried on writing tracks and Steve and Rob, who owned the label, they really pushed me and just, offered me a deal and kicked me out of the office. It was a bit of a nuisance. And um, that was it, really. That's cool. Um, that's um, Sparrow. That's from my first album. So, uh, so that was recorded like 95 or 96? Or? Um, that was recorded in probably 97, 98. After your first album then, like did DJ gigs really pick up then? Like more people asking you like internationally? Um, y yes, but actually I've been doing a lot of that before. Okay. So I'd been playing in Europe mostly. Um, the one thing about um, the kind of stuff I play, I tend to play more in Europe than I do at home, weirdly enough. Um, so it's great because I've been to sort of Latvia and Slovakia and loads of places I would have never ever been and Iceland and um, you know so it's, it's pretty amazing so yeah I mean obviously I'm sure work did pick up if you put a record out it always does um, but I'd been playing quite a lot before that so yeah it was just a continuation and when you go out and play do you play like 
abstract music? I tend to, yeah. I mean, I tend to play... It really varies. It depends where I'm playing. Because I, um, I've done a lot of playing with bands, so, uh, you know, opening up before them and playing in between bands. And I really like doing that sort of thing. So I do a lot of gig stuff. And um, it depends very much who I'm playing with. Because I've got a really wide taste and a very broad record collection, and I tend to sort of have to, you know, you can't carry your record collection with you. Well, you can it, in an MP3 but player, it, but, yeah. you know, um, I tend to play with records, so you can only carry so much. And um, so I, I tend to sort of try and go with what I'm playing and be sympathetic to who I'm playing with, because I, I'm usually playing with people I like. I don't play with people I'm not into. Like, what's an example of a band that you've, like, you know, toured with as, like, the... Um, the music of the evening or the... I've played, I mean, I've played a lot, a lot of sort of one-offs with a, obviously a lot of the warp artists. Um, I've played with a band called Pram, who I really like. Oh, yeah. Um, too Pure. Too Pure, yes. Um, and I'm trying to think. A lot of the Sarko people and um, I don't know, just, yeah, loads. And uh, um, so you usually play off vinyl and like how do like crowds react? Like, do people still stare at you? Like, you're supposed to be like, you know, an exhibit. A, a, like, like <laughs> a, acting like, you know, that, you know, maybe like if you touch the bass fader, it's so hot that, you know. I think it depends <laughs> where you play. Um, sometimes I've had that, and it's really, it's really freaky because I don't do much. I'm not Jeff Mills, you know, and um, and I'm not a sort of whatever craze or something. So I'm not there, sort of freaking out on the on the mixer. So it's. I think when loads of people look at you, you sort of think, there's nothing to look at. You might as well look over there. But um, in other places, you know, people just have a good time. They dance or they sit around or they do whatever they want. So, yeah, I've had those kind of gigs where everyone's... But y the thing is, when everyone's right there, it's usually because they, they're really interested and they, you have to sort of remember, although it's intimidating to have a wall of faces in front of you, mm -hmm. they, they're there to... Um, they want to know what the records are. My best is when people try and read labels as they go around which I think is practically impossible. And, you know, I'm always just... You never figured it out? No, I just hand them the record <laughs> sleeve because you can just see they're straining, you know. And um, I, I'm not... I, I don't sort of feel it's a secret. I'm quite happy to tell people mm -hmm. what I'm playing. That's the point that I'm there for, you know. It's to share what I think is really good. So I'm quite happy to actually share it and not make them try and figure out what white label it is or something. In, in your gigs, like, where's, like, one of the most bizarre like times you've had playing in front of people, like a strange gig? I've had a lot of really, really bizarre experiences. Um, but I think a really great one was in, in Iceland um, because it was in a school and you couldn't smoke and I seriously need to smoke when I play. And um, everybody was seated, proper school hall, so everybody was seated on school chairs. And... Um, and it was very strange because I started playing and um, people would clap, it's more or less, you know, after each record. And I thought, okay, this is pretty surreal, but I'll keep going. I'd not experienced that before. And then at, after about half an hour, um, I put on um, window liquor, which hadn't actually come out yet. And it was the most amazing thing. You just saw chairs flying. Literally, everyone just got up and all these chairs just moved to the side in about 30 seconds. And um, after that, it, just, it was just crazy. So how often do you uh, go into the studio? Like, what motivates you to go into the studio? Um, it's usually just craziness. I actually just really need to be there. And um, because I, I go away and I, I tour quite a lot, I don't have loads of time in the studio and it's really quite precious to me and um, when I have time in the studio it tends to be in short blocks and I go in because I really want to go in and, and have some fun and uh, for me going in the studio is just a chance to play and although I use analog synths and I use a computer and I use a lot of digital stuff I also really like recording and using found sounds so um, I made a record that's pretty much just made of pebble sounds. And so it's, it's a whole, it's an adventure. It's like being, I don't know, a Girl Scout or something. So, you know, you get to go out and record stuff and then you get to sit inside and play with it. And 
it's, you know, that's all the gigging and stuff is great and I really enjoy it, but I think probably most people here who make music, when you're in the studio, that's, you know, that's when you're really happiest because it's when you get to make yourself happy and there's no other elements that are going to distract from that or detract from it. I did this project um, last year that um, basically it was to do with the Museum of Natural History in um, Geneva and the idea was to compose a track just made out of insect sounds and um, then to go and perform it in the museum which was pretty amazing because I was sort of standing there under a dinosaur skeleton and stuff and um, I had to make 30 minutes of music. Um, Based on a trash compactor? Yeah, why not? And um, so yeah, there was this idea of writing a piece, but you couldn't add anything to it, so you had to just make it with the insects. Um, and you could affect them, you could do things to them, but you couldn't add any instrumentation whatsoever. Um, and this is just a little part of it. They actually gave me a lot of the insect sounds, and the rest of the stuff, I actually just put a microphone in a shoebox and um, just put it outside, and basically just to protect it from the wind. Um, so yeah, really simple sort of school, school kid stuff. Um, but that's a really good way, because you can just leave, leave it running and just come back to it and, and hear what you've got. Basically took this piece earlier this year and worked with um, the London Sinfonietta, which is an orchestra. And we did the piece again, but we did it with an orchestra and um, the material that I had, which I sort of w reworked. And then we actually had live insects on stage at the South Bank at the Royal Festival Hall, which is the first time they've ever done that. That was quite amazing. And they'd, we managed to get tiny little cameras in there. And there was a, they're not supposed to eat each other, but for some reason they decided that there was going to be a massacre. So there's loads of people squirming in the audience. So there's a huge, I don't know, sort of 20, 30 meter screen of of all this insect annihilation. But I, I actually, I thought it was great. It was, it was alive, you know, it really worked. Do you draw from any, like, you know, you talked about working with the symphony. Yeah. Do you draw from any classical music background? Or? Um, I don't really, I don't really, um, I didn't sort of grow up listening to classical music. I, I do love a lot of, um, I guess, more contemporary classical or what's considered classical, but maybe is more sort of early computer music that mixes um, with that. Uh, People like, like, like Xenakis? Or? Yeah, like Xenakis and um, Stockhausen Contact and things like that. And, but I think for me that I really love um, string instruments. I tend to like all instruments made of wood. So I've got a wood thing going on. And I, d I record a lot of wood, and I really love the sound of wood. So pianos and strings and cellos and stuff. So for me, working with the Sinfonietta was amazing because they're very talented people. And um, just actually getting to hear what they could do with those instruments because um, we were working on, the, on this idea of the insects. So they were trying to make insect sounds with instruments. Um, which is, is actually, on one level, sounds really corny, but when you hear it, it actually, it sounds pretty amazing that people can really work these, you know, quite simple, small instruments and make such incredible sounds come out of them that you don't normally get to hear. You know, you normally hear great violinists play Vivaldi, you know, but mm -hmm. this was actually hearing great violinists do that. You know. Creep you out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that sounds actually like a pretty amazing experience because it seems like they're stuck in this sequencer mode or something. Yeah. That those guys, and you know that they're fantastic musicians. Yeah, totally. You and know that, they that live the and thing. breathe yeah. these instruments. And it's, you know, people with perfect pitch and people with just amazing ears. And um, I think, uh, you know, in any experience like that, you learn something. And it was great because I learned something, but, you know, they did too. So it, it was good. So, um, was that version recorded and, and will that be released? It was. I think it will be released um, at some point because it was an evening where they did, um, they actually scored, that was an improvised piece that we rehearsed and worked on, but they scored um, a Boards of Canada track and Square Push track and an Aphex Twin track. And we also, that evening was, um, they did a, a Stockhausen piece and um, I'm trying to think, they did Ligeti and... Um, John Cage stuff. So it was quite an amazing evening of really, uh, they sort of called it, you know, 
contemporary masters or whatever, something to that effect. So it was all those kind of um, pieces. And then, you know, they'd scored electronic tracks. How, how big was the orchestra, like full 72 piece? Um, Symphonietta is basically half an orchestra, right. so it's half a symphony, because a symphony orchestra can, it can go up to hundreds. So it's just one set of each section. Can you tell us more about uh, working with an orchestral arrangement? Um, well, what I did was I actually, um, so I had the piece, obviously, which I'd written, that, and it was actually that section of the piece. Um, I do have the, a, a live recording of the orchestra version. We, okay, let's put that on. Um, but I need to learn how to skip because it's the whole evening. Okay, correct. So we need to Time to rock the deck. And then you can actually hear the difference. And basically, we, we scored the key notes from the piece because all those string sections are made from wasps. That's how I did it. So, um, so not we the synth. No, there's no synth. There's no, it's a, not, not a wasp synth. No, no. Actual no. wasps. No, an actual wasps. And um, so we worked from that. And then we worked um, on an improvisational situation where I had my Mac. And they listened to the piece. And then we started to basically um, try and get them to improvise certain insect sounds and took it from there. And it was really just sitting around and playing bits. So it wasn't fully scored. It was, semi, it was a semi-scored situation and then t took it from there. So they had quite a lot of input, although obviously I could say that sounds really great and we need a bit more you know, with a clarinet or whatever. So um, it worked as a group. It was pretty amazing. The, right at the beginning, there was actually a woman because th that the um, the hall where that was performed. There's surround sound, so obviously not, a lot of that you don't get on the recording. But the one of the violinists actually played it her violin all with her teeth. So that scraping that you hear at the beginning is just this woman playing it with her teeth. <laughs> it's pretty mad to look at. And uh, I mean, don't those halls have like? natural acoustic resonance and stuff. They do, yeah, they do. And then it's also mic'd up and it, I mean, it's a beautiful big theatre. So it's quite incredible. You were speaking about Stockhausen earlier and yeah. so something amazing about Stockhausen is that he's been on the cutting edge for about 50 years. Yeah. He had 50 years to try and digest the bastard and yeah. we still can't. can't. <laughs> um, but that's because he's got more extreme. Now he's doing crazy operas with gremlins and things. And, well, and helicopters and yeah. all that. that was even like about 10 years ago. Yeah. And I'm just wanting to know in your opinion and purely in your opinion, yeah. be as indulgent as you like, um, who do you think at the moment is making stuff that is beyond their time and will influence people for the next, I mean, let, let's throw this out, like 20, 50 years, just in the way that Stockhausen started with in 1954 with yeah. all his crazy stuff that has gone on to influence Cage, that has gone on to influence probably all of us today. We might not know yeah, that. Yeah, even though we're not aware of it. Of course. I mean, who for you is, is making stuff that's out there and beyond their time? Um, so really it's an it's, it's yeah it's it is pretty difficult um i'd probably say um Orteca, really um but if you're looking in the sort of classical world and if you sort of look at that side of things although he's n it, it is older stuff i'd say todd dockstader because i think that's really, it's probably really coming to its own now. And I think we hear a lot of stuff that actually sounds so much like what he was doing, but he was doing it on tape. And now people do it with VST plugins and stuff. But um, that's somebody from that sort of world, I would say, um, definitely fits that description. But it's, it's hard with people who are contemporaries, with people who are around, because it's hard to sort of see. I think you more have to look at it where people don't get it now and think, well, they're probably going to get it at some point in the future. Um, the reason I said Orteca was because um, the guy that I used to work for in the record shop, he had this thing where he always used to listen, whenever they brought an album out, he'd start listening to the album before, and then he'd say, oh, I'm just getting into that now. So he, ha he had this thing going, he's always one album behind, which to me is an indication of it being slightly too forward. 
you know. I've got a friend as far as uh, music ahead of time who's convinced that Muslim gores is the same angle. And I've, as much as I've tried to listen to the hundreds of Muslim gores records, I yeah. can't see it myself. Yeah. What, what's your interpretation of his work? Um, I'm not incredibly familiar with it. I've got one Muslim gores record, um, which I really, really like. But I, it's hard for me to say because I'm not, I don't know it all and I'd, I really don't know. But that is a really beautiful record. But it's very old now. He's, he's apparently done hundreds of them. I mean, he's, they seem to be one a week for a while coming out. And yeah. It's very strange mentality. Like, I'm not sure how his process works. It's not like a normal person. Yeah. He just, he's doing something that is so particular to him. Yes. That he, he has to do it. It's like a driven thing. I yeah. mean, unfortunately, he's died now. But I'm, Yes, that's... I mean, yeah, I was wondering if you could confirm or deny that because there's been a whole lot of Muslim gores come out in the last month or so, and it's sort of really? like, maybe he's not. Well, I don't know, because as far as I knew, um, he died, and as far as I knew, he died a good four years ago. Yeah, about three or four years yeah. ago, yeah. But it seems the releases just keep coming. But I don't know, maybe, maybe it's a friend. Tupac just had a movie. <laughs> Yeah, but it's not quite the same <laughs> situation. I don't think his record company is sitting there going, we must cash in now, we'll, we'll, we'll do them. I don't know what the story is, but I, I also heard that he died. Good trick, Zootsy. <laughs> Any further uh, uh, crowd participation here? I just want to go. So I think we got... Uh, one more. Just wondering if Warp are going to release that night of music with the score of the Square Push. Yeah. Um, yes, I think they are. I think um, I think they'll release all the Warp stuff. I don't know if they'll do the sort of John Cage and the Leggetti, because it's obviously m harder to get the agreements for all of that. Um, but as far as I know, um, we're actually going to, because that was just done in London, it was a one-off, and we're going to do the whole evening, the whole program again in... Um, in Holland and Belgium and France in June. So I think they'll release it then. They'll probably link it up. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I think it's time. Well, it's time uh, you went to the beach and went up the mountain and actually saw something. <laughs> so uh, uh, I'd like to thank you, Mira. Thank you. Chantel. Thank you.